we have been reading Island Affair all month long and definitely enjoying a little trip to Key West. Um, Priscilla, um, this is, I want to say it's like the fourth book of yours that I've read because oh. I read your last series, but this, it's not the fourth book you've written. You also have um, some yes. others. I have several others. I have in, in the first series was the Match to Perfection series, mm -hmm. which was his perfect partner and her perfect affair and their perfect melody. Yep. And within that, um, I had the opportunity, Kensington offered me to write a novella as part of the Fern Michaels Holiday Anthology, A Season to Celebrate. Mm -hmm. So I have a novella in that. It's called Holiday Home Run. And we kept that underneath the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the Fernandez Familia umbrella. And that is their, it features their cousin, Julia, who comes to Chicago for an internship. She comes from Puerto Rico. And so that one also takes place in and around Chicago, like the Match to Perfection series does. Yeah. And then I also wrote a book for Thule Publishing. It's book three in um, a four-part book series called Paradise Key, and that one is Resort to Love. Okay, so I think those are the two that I that I haven't read. Do all your books um, feature Latinx characters? Yes. So far? Yes. Mm -hmm. So actually, it's, it's a mix. All of the heroines are Latinas. Um, all of the heroes are not, so um, thus far. But although actually in Island Affair, it's Luis, who is Cuban, yeah. and, and, and Sarah is Sarah is not. The rest of the series, both of, well, the, the, they feature the Navarro Familia. So there's a sister, Ana Maria, that will be book two, and Enrique is book three. But both of their love interests are also Latinx. Okay. So, so you I, kind of write a mix as far as the couples go, but there's right. always a so far always a Latin character. Yeah, somewhere. that's far. I think what 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 really draws me to to continue writing is is writing books that have um, feature familias like mine. You know, yeah. and we are a mix. I mean, like my obviously my siblings and I are all Latinx, but uh, are different you know partners. And same thing with my cousins and my primas in Puerto Rico and in San Antonio and in you know throughout Texas. We're yeah. we're a mix. That's the world I I inhabit and so that's kind of the world I would like to write about yeah I um interestingly we were talking about um Island Affair mm -hmm. um you mentioned that it's not an own voices book even though the um the familia that's there is Latin they're Cuban and mm -hmm. so that's um very true to Key West but not your particular background um, right. So I think the different, like some some um, listeners or, you know, readers might have heard of the own voices movement. And really what that is, is when an author is writing about their culture, you know, or, or their, mm -hmm. their background. So even though the Navajo Familia and my Familia fits under the, you know, Latino, Latinx umbrella, they're Cubans. Mm -hmm. I'm a Puerto Rican, Mexican mix. And, yeah. um, the reason why, you know, I did have a friend say, well, yeah, but why not write just about Puerto Ricans? Well, because the, the Cuban culture is predominant, is the predominant one, obviously, in Key West. And so to be true to the familia friends that, that I grew up with there and that mm -hmm. I still have there, um, I wanted to feature, uh, um, you know, that I wanted to kind of bring to life the Cuban culture that is there on the island. So it's not own voices. I would say it's Latinx ROM. If you're looking for Latinx romance and you can always search for the hashtag Latinx ROM, R-O-M, and um, a lot of the authors, a lot of us will use that. So it does fall under that umbrella. Yeah, my family is um, from uh, Panama, the, the country of Panama. Um, and I thought it was funny, like there is some overlap, but things aren't exactly the same. So I think slang in Panama is very different than say Puerto Rico or Cuba or uh, other Central American countries. Yes. But um, when I was reading Island Affair, I noticed that Sarah goes to that um, El Mesón de Pepe and orders um, ropa vieja, which mm -hmm. is like a food that my mom used to make when I was a kid. And I was like, yes. oh, I have to make it. It's so, yes. I was like, very, um, it was kind of funny. I think when I did my recap um, and I looked back, I was like, well, here's the part when I got totally sidetracked <laughs> with the food <laughs> that we're eating. Um, do you find it 
challenging sometimes because of that kind of overlap to like make sure that the cultures feel distinct when they're not like your culture but yes kind of adjacent. Well, I will say my mom is my mom is really good about like knowing the differentiations like nuances more than I am she, I mean she has some uh, her work history also um I'm like we used when I was a kid we lived in the military base in, in Cuba my dad was in the navy and so my mom worked for the the JAG officer there um, oh, cool. and did a lot of work with helping Cubans who had exiled themselves there and through the naturalization process. So that began um, kind of our familias and, and, and mine as a kid learning more about um, Cuban culture and Cuban lifestyle and, and, and having, you know, close family ties to, um, but so my mom is one of my beta readers. And mm -hmm. so she will read and, and I will even say like in the match to perfection series, yeah, those girls, those sisters, the Fernandez sisters are Puerto Ricanas, and, and I kind of shared this earlier, like in in, a, in another you know talk with readers and with other authors. My mom noticed at one time I got a track change note. Um, one of the sisters saying something in Spanish. There was like a phrase or a term, and my mom's track change note was, "Well, it can be said like this, right?" And <laughs> your your cousins in San Antonio would use this word, and we use this word interchangeably, but. In Puerto Rico, we, we remember we say this word. And um, so it was like a similar, same idea, but a, like a, um, a Puerto Rican idiom. And, and our sounds house, very tactful. <laughs> <yes>. <laughs> and in our house, we use either one, right? Because we, we can co-change like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but the Fernandez sisters would use the Puerto Rican one. And I needed to make sure. So with, with this book, and, and actually, um, actually with book two, I'm reaching out to some readers um, that are Cuban that have been reading all of my series um, mm -hmm. to just to get some some other feedback. I mean, mommy's read, mommy's reading them, and 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 kind of having my back and and checking those kinds of things because yes, it is. You're right. There are there are nuances in foods, in 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 phrases, in in dialect. Uh, you know, so it's we have a lot of similarities, but we also have um, little differences. I, I think a easy English way, um, English language way in the United States is to think about it. Like if you want a soda in, you know, in some places they're going to order a Coke, they're going to say, I want a Coke. In some places they'll say, I want a pop. In yeah. some places it'll be soda, right? Yeah. Um, that's kind of how it is with Spanish in the different, you know, um, Latino, um, you know, Latinx countries. Yeah. You're reminding me. So I, I'm currently living in Atlanta. My, my family's from um, Panama and grew up in Toronto. Um, but when we moved to Atlanta, Georgia, I was very confused when I heard people ordering orange Coke. Oh. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> does Coke make an orange? Like, I, I was very, and they were like, it's because everything, everything, everything fizzy here is Coke. It's Coke, yes. Yeah, so it just kind of, that's how it is. Um, even within the Caribbean, you know, we have Puerto Ricans, we have a lot of similarities with, with DR, with, with the Dominicans, with Cubans, mm -hmm. but yet there are different dishes. There are different, and, and even us as a grouping, like we'll have a lot of rice, we'll have a lot of plantains, right? My, my familia in San Antonio, there's tortillas, mm -hmm. um, you know, and spicy food, which is not common in, in Puerto Rico. So yeah. Like well, like that. the Panamanian tortilla is very different than the Mexican one, which is, you know, it's like a big you cut it and it's not oh. you know it's like a breakfast but they make a big or my my grandma used to make it really it was thick and they put it like like cooked it on a plancha like on the stove and then um and then you would cut it into pieces and eat it like with an egg is or it whatever. flour or is it is is it my yeast is it, it was corn? my yeast it's corn yeah Oh, um, okay. it's yummy, but it's completely different. And you don't eat yeah. tortillas like with all your food. It's just like kind of a breakfast food or like a snacky thing. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. So, and, and I think in, uh, Costa Rica, they make like these little ones that are a little bit thicker than the Mexican ones. And they do eat that, eat it with all their food, with everything But you go one country over and Panama's like, what are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what makes it unique. So yeah. that's, that's the beauty of it. I think. Yeah, I think that's also um, why I love to see um, more and more um, representation of like diversity yeah. um, and even within and why, you know, you can't say like one, we have, a, we have a Latin writer, we I've read a Latinx right. book because there's a lot more to see. Yeah. yeah. 
and I think within other cultures too, I think about Indian um, culture also and like how many different uh, regions and how the food's very different and the language can be like a whole yeah. other language. Um, right. So it's so a, with, Oh, go on. No, so, go ahead. I was going to say, so with Island Affair, like in this book, since Sarah's a tourist, I try like when they go to Itamis on the Pepe, mm -hmm. uh, um, I try to bring in a little bit of, I don't want it to turn into a history lesson either. Uh, uh, right. So I tried to bring a little bit of the Cuban history, you know, of, um, of, you know, there were 90 miles away from, from Havana, yeah. uh, um, in this one. And also in, in, in the, in book two, I almost just said the title and I'm not sure if I'm allowed to yet. Huh. So, uh, <laughs> I uh, kind of um, want to know though. Uh, um, I, I, tell I us if it's a second to, chance yeah. romance, because that's what I need to know. It is. Yes. Okay. Good. Yes, so book two is Ana Maria, and it is her high school sweetheart that we hear a little bit about in, in this, in Island of Affair. And yeah, well, in Island Affair, we find out that she had, like, big dreams, but then kind of scaled back to help her family, which I think yes. is a thing that probably a lot of people can relate to. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm excited to see Yes, her. so Alejandro comes back, her... Her high school sweetheart left and became like a really uh, a well-known adventure and commercial photographer, but he's injured um, while he's like right after a shoot. And so he's forced to come home to kind of rehab and mm. he has not been home since he left. And she is kind of a rehab exercise person. Right. Well, she's firefighter paramedic, but on the side, like her side hustle which mm -hmm. a lot of the firefighters um, have, you know, have to have down um, in the Keys and, and maybe elsewhere as well, but I know specifically to the Keys, is she's a personal trainer. And so yeah. she has been, that was her big, you, you learn in Island Affair that she already knows who Sarah is. Like Sarah mm -hmm. Vance in Island Affair is a social media influencer with a, with a big following and um, Luis doesn't do social media. He's, you know, he's that anti-sharing, like, what do I want? Why do I care what you're eating? Why do I want to show you a picture of what I'm eating? You know, kind of guy. Yeah. Uh, but his sister, Ana Maria, has been following Sarah's kind of rise up through social media. Um, and right. And she, it seems like um, Luis doesn't, until this story starts, he doesn't seem to really see social media as anything more than just like, like you said, like people sharing their food or people right. just kind of yeah. Yeah. putting w what they're doing. It's like a way there. to overshare because, but, because of that, who he is, is he's very reserved. You know? But Sarah is really, that's her, that's her business. Yeah. And I think his sister can connect with Sarah on that, where she sees potential for like growing a business using yes. social media yes. that way, mm -hmm. um, which is really, it's really kind of interesting. I, um, I know that Luis, a.k.a. San Navarro, is your, your mom's fave, so we have yes. to spend some time talking with him, right? Yes. Or about him. <laughs> um, well, I talk to him all the time. Sometimes people are like, when I say that, non-writers are like, what do you mean you talk with him? I'm like, but <laughs> anyway. <It's a> thing. <laughs> I don't know. It's, um, it's interesting to see his kind of evolution through the story because – he, um, he's gone through some things. Yeah. And he, at the beginning of the story, seems very like everything's fine and we don't need to talk about this. Right. Um, we're just gonna move on, do our things. <laughs> it's gonna be everything. Gonna gonna be okay. He's dealing with it by focusing on everybody else that has problems and helping those people with their problems because he doesn't have problems. Is, right. is, 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 well, it's easy when your work is to like save people, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it seems like that is like a, an instinct of him, his, even from the times past, like even <laughs> from when he was younger. Yeah. Um, to be helpful. I, I mean, that's how he, that's how he has come by his nickname. Like you, you, you learned a little story. Uh, um, in in island affair you know mm -hmm. they're they're at like a church retreat and and he's helping like the nuns and so yeah the, the siblings you know his older brother carlos to just kind of you know egg him along a little bit gives him the nickname san navarro saint navarro and it, it it's kind of stuck because it fits um, yeah. which is nice in in most times but i think the reason he didn't he what you know he wasn't with the right person all those years ago like when when 
the backstory problem happens. I'm not, I'm, I don't want to give away like too much. Yeah. Uh, was because he was still in savior mode. And one thing that, you know, from the very beginning, we learned that Sarah's like, not doesn't want to be saved. You know, her, her parents are thinking she's, you know, doing the social media for fun stuff, you know, until she kind of finds somebody and settles down into, you know, something a little bit more stable. Um, she needs someone who can, who can help her, who can kind of take care of her. Mm -hmm. um, and her whole thing is, I don't need anybody to take care of me, to yeah. come in and save Ironically, she does need him to save her at the very beginning when, you know, she's dumped and she needs someone to step in as, as her, as her significant other, you know, kind of partner, boyfriend, what, you know, what have you. Um, but it is, a, it's something that they have to learn um, from each other. Yeah. I did find that like an interesting thing about their pairing was that she, um, He's very like, I want to help. And she very much wants to kind of prove herself and show people that she can do, that she can do things on her own and she can yeah. accomplish her stuff herself. Um, where Luis comes from a family that seems very, um, like, like they support each other and kind of are like, whatever you do is fine. We'll be here for you or whatever. Her family, um, is, is very united also, but in a different, a completely different dynamic. Like they're very um, uh, driven and also like value in a way that's very different from it's pardon. They're like independent. Yes. Of. Yeah. But also like competitive even with like, mm -hmm. you know, that where they, um, they each have are very kind of high achievers and yeah. because they're in the same field, it seems like they all kind of, not that they're trying to one up each other necessarily, but just that they, that they measure their success in a very particular way. Yes. Um, and Sarah doesn't, I mean, she is a social media influencer and like probably like marketing guru. <laughs> she has as many followers and has, you know, like, yeah, really, as you read the book, she's expert in her field. Yeah. But it's such a different right. field. <laughs> yeah. She, she's always felt like one being born so much later, like the obvious oops baby, all right, and, and, and her yeah. family, um, to parents who are, you know, were so career driven, to have older siblings who are so successful in areas that she's not successful in. So she's always felt odd man out, which is mm -hmm. kind of what led to her, you know, the, the emotional issues that then led to her, I, I'm not, I don't think we've said it yet, that Sarah is in recovery um, with OSFED, which is an eating disorder, other mm -hmm. specified feeding and eating disorder. And she's in recovery with that, which is one of the reasons why it has kind of drawn her family together. But she kind of feels like, you know what, everybody was doing their own thing and not paying attention to me before. But now, because I'm a, I could be like your patient, and, and now everybody wants to be involved. And that's not, that's not why I want you to kind of be involved in my, yeah. in my life. Uh -uh. It's such a tricky dynamic to be in yeah. a situation, I feel like, where you, like, it's it's everything you always wanted and everything you, like, were afraid would happen because yeah. she wants attention for, from her family. She wants to feel loved. She wants them to, like, be together. But, be in a group. Yeah, but she doesn't want them to, she doesn't want to be their project or them to be worrying about yes. her. Like, she wants to be right. on equal footing, which um, Luis because he's such a good helper <laughs> seems to seems to like intuitively like know how to how to smooth the edges and kind of help help with that yeah like he he fits in really well almost to almost to a point that i had to be careful that she didn't like you know that she didn't then kind of like be bothered by damn he just fit right in and i've been part of this family forever and I, and I haven't been able to fit in. Yeah. Uh, um, and, but this yet is I a realistic thing though. I feel like it, that it could be, it could be, I hope so. I, I, you know, like when you sit at your, at your desk and you're typing and, and you're, and then you take a step back, I'm like, well, it's, it sounds like it works, but maybe it's cause I'm, you know, I'm too close. I'm too involved. So it's, I, you're, I'm always like nervous <laughs> and excited a little bit, yeah. you know, when your book is out to see how readers will. Uh, um, but I think, it's an interesting dynamic between the two. Um, Sarah, like you said, wants to prove herself and, and needs to learn how to, you know, accept her, her family's help in, in a way now mm -hmm. and, and accept Luis's help. But Luis also has to learn that he, he can't fix everything. Um, yeah. And 
Um, and then he really partner. doesn't need to. Like it's not right. You know? right. There's a partner, like she needs a partner. She doesn't need a savior. Yeah. Um, and I also wanted, um, you know how like a, like you can put a little bit of yourself in like in books. Like people always ask, so how is 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 any are are you in here? Or are you like any characters? I think a, an important life lesson that that I that I hope I've learned that I, that Luis needed to learn is is you know like to have a healthy relationship. You have to you have to work on yourself to be healthy so that you're bringing a healthy person like to the table mm -hmm. and, and hopefully the other person as well and so he wasn't going to be in any kind of healthy relationship until he did exactly what his commander tells him or his captain tells him at the very beginning get your head on straight you know yeah. and he is and his mommy, i feel like his mom has been kind of chasing yeah. him like you know poking at that for a while and yeah. he's very like no thank you yeah but She's she right. Not let him. Let him stop. His, no. the, his his mom. The mothers in book two have a little bit. The mommies um are really big meddling mommies because they're best friends. So oh. I was excited. <laughs> I'm excited for um, been another, waiting. another Navajo Familia dinner, and there's you know also time with Alejandro's um Familia, you know as well. Oh, and, be yeah, fun. The, his, their mother, the Navajo the Navajo mother um was was not ever going to, you know, in this book, um, uh, um, Enrique, the younger brother, and Luis are at odds because that's something that's happened in the past. And um, the mom always trying, you know, mm -hmm. to get them back together. But really it's, um, it's Sarah who kind of forces him to, to uh, kind of like a, a, a reckoning. You got to deal with your stuff. Like, I don't, I don't need, you know, I don't need you to save me. You need to like figure out how to save yourself. Kind yeah. Of. So. Yeah, she's very, um, she's a really strong character, and it's, um, it's, ni it's nice to see it in a romance, um, when I think we're seeing a bit more of that in, like, contemporary romance now, mm -hmm. and even historical, too, where women are um, kind of de demanding, like, to have yeah. a partnership versus, I mean, it's nice, I, I don't know, it's nice to be, to feel like someone would save you, but it's, also important to know that they also could give you the space to do, you know, yourself. Save yourself. yeah. <laughs> right. And, 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 and like a third dimension of that is they would be accepting of, of like her saving him. Right. Mm -hmm. or, or if it's a, you know, a, a, you know, a male, male, female, female, but whoever your love interest is, doesn't feel like they've got, you know, like you're their project. They're, they're saving you all the time. There's yeah. time for both of you to stand on your own, but, time for each of you to be there for the other you know and to be open to that yeah it's important true. yeah very true so is that um are those kind of themes things that you um actively like plan to put into your stories or are they things that just kind of pop in as you're writing and then and then you like tease them out later um Probably like I don't I don't go in thinking about theme or okay. lesson lesson learned or anything like that. I I for me because I am more of a plotter where I need to kind of have an idea of where the story is going, you know, where it needs to go. It's kind of like a security blanket for me to make sure I'm not riding in circles mm -hmm. and, and and then realizing I just have like a bunch of fluff that has them going nowhere. Huh. Um, but I will say that yes, as I get to the end, like often while I get to the end, there's something that has come up that I realize like a lesson or while I'm thinking about the scenes that, that I've, that I've written either like washing the dishes or cooking dinner or out for a run. Uh, and I'm kind of replaying the book in my head. I realize like a note will come like, like a lesson or just some, some kind of thread that I realize that I think will enrich a little bit. And then I need to go back and, and make sure that I've kind of layered it throughout. Um, so that happens usually like during revisions Okay. There's something I've come up with or in speaking with my, my editor, um, when, when they, when they get the book, always, when I send my manuscript in, in the email is always any idea you have about how this can improve or how this can be enriched, or this could be a stronger story, throw it at me. Cause <laughs> that's like our, you know, the ultimate goal is to, to give the best book. Cause by then. I'm so, I'm so in love with the characters. Like I want, I, I, Luis is like, well, he, he's like my ultimate hero between Luis and Diego, um, book three, <laughs> their perfect yeah. melody. I'm kind of 
torn between those, but, and, and Sarah, I just, um, I'm, I'm so proud of her, you know, like I feel like she's like my girlfriend or maybe my younger sister. And so I just want their story to be the best it can. Or now Ana Maria and Alejandro, you know, since that's, it, it, that's off to Kensington. Uh, um, and, and so I want readers to, to feel for them like, like I do, and they yeah. will do that. And if I have, if I haven't done a good enough job. Yeah. Um, well, I think we do have several, um, writers who, um, follow us on Instagram. And I think one thing that I've seen or heard writers say before is that you, since you know what you meant to write, it's important to have somebody else look at it and make sure that it actually made it onto the page. Translate. Yes. Um, but do you, um, because now since you've written more and more books and you teach writing also, Mm -hmm. do you find that there are any kind of shortcuts or well, I don't know, shortcut if there's ever really shortcuts in writing but if there are any <laughs> tricks or things that you can do to kind of keep yourself keep your eyes fresh I guess when you're looking back at your manuscript um I mean well gosh in, in an ideal world you you finish and then you have a you have a little bit of time before you go back to revisions so but I I, I never give myself that amount of time like by when my deadline is usually I'm like I'm butting up to that deadline and like Okay, 11.59 p.m. is still this date, right? So if I said <laughs> by 11.59 p.m., I had met that deadline. Uh, um, so, but, but then there's a little bit of distance between when I send that away and I get revisions. Mm-hmm. So that's helpful. I think like the best thing to do, like Stephen King and his book on writing mm-hmm. recommends finish your draft and put it in a drawer and then wait like six weeks or eight weeks, something like that. If you have that time, great. For me, it's whatever amount of time my editor is going to give me before I get back revisions. Um, and then when you get that manuscript back or when you take it out of the drawer, whichever one it is, um, sit down and read it like page one till the end. And, and you can make some notes, but do not start like heavy revising. He, he says, just like read it and any glaring thing, like maybe make a note or, or um, in the margin or on a piece of paper, but keep re- try to read it all the way through like a reader would because, mm-hmm. you know, like, so it's, it's a new to get the full experience. Kind of to you. Yeah. To get the full experience. Supposedly like that's when like, if there's a theme that's underlying there that you might not have even realized it might grab you, you know, as a reader. So if you, if you have the ability to do that, a lot of that now for me depends on what's the timing, how, how much time do I have for revisions, how many revisions, you know, um, what that looks like um, from my editor, if I have time to read it through like that, or if I just have to dig in so that at the end, I have time to read it from beginning to end to then make sure during revisions, something didn't slip out or... Um, you know, cutting and moving things. I didn't, you know, like leave, leave half a sentence somewhere by accident kind of thing. So yeah. it's important to try to have that time at the end. Um, so I don't, I don't pre-plan things like that. It, because for me, as I'm writing the book, even like I say, I'm a plotter and I, and I have like scenes mapped out. Every manuscript that I've done that with at some point, like a different idea comes up for a different scene or the character. Um, like when I was writing Their Perfect Melody, I had, mm-hmm. when Lily invites Diego to come home, I had like something different happening and, and I struggled with this scene for a couple days. And then um, this is when I had a conversation with, with, and, um, not, with, with Diego about like, dude, what is going on? I was driving to campus one day and I just, he was riding shotgun, right? And, um, and I just had a, and he had a different idea. You know, I'm saying like, how come you're not cooperating with me? Like, this is how it should be going. And, and when I, as the author stepped out of the way and went with this new idea that I'm my imagination, not, not Diego, if I want yeah. to make sure that I sound sane, uh-uh, <laughs> I will say Diego told me. Uh, and so, you know, if something better comes up, it's because by then, I am more entrenched in the actual story and, mm-hmm. and I know the characters even better at that point than I did in the beginning. Didn't matter how many character sketches or GMC charts or interviewing or whatever I do to prepare to start. Uh, um, inevitably, you know your character better and it's, and you have to go with those things. They're like, they're like gifts when something like that happens. It's a better idea that enriches your story, even if it means making yourself a note that, okay, earlier in the chapter, I need to hint that, you know, this has happened or this could happen so that it doesn't seem so, you know, you go with that. 
Cool. So, um, so you're a, pl a plan, a uh, plotter, but you still have to leave yourself that space yeah. to like kind of roll with it as you. So maybe a planter, like a little bit of a planter, but there, but. But mostly um, plotting. I, yeah, but heavy, heavy on the plotter side. <laughs> um, has that always been the case for you? I think so. Uh, I, I will say that doing so, kind of like I alluded to earlier, kind of um, quiets that imposter syndrome of like starting a book is one of the hardest. Starting a book and finishing a book, or like meeting the deadline, like like wanting more time so I can make it better by the end. But hmm. starting a book is always hard for me. Uh, the, those doubts of, are you sure you know what you're doing? Maybe you need to research more. Maybe you need to learn a little bit more, um, kind of stall me from starting like chapter one, you know, yeah. with a dark and stormy night, whatever, you know, whatever <laughs> that first line is going to be. But, um, and, but having, having a plan, even knowing now, yes, you have a plan, but it's going to change. So just go with it when that happens. But having a plan kind of, silences that as far as look I know what I'm doing or at least I think I know what I'm doing so hush I have a plan yes um as far as research goes I know you lived in Key West you said for a while so that explains why you could like talk about the area and like really describe uh landmarks and places that actually exist there and what they you know what the feel of it would be if you were really there um are there parts of that, like the firefighting or, or in any of your other books, things that you really had to dive into the research? And is there anything surprising that you uncovered that made it into the book? Yeah, well, I will say, I mean, Key West has changed a lot since I was a, a child. I mean, mm -hmm. since I was an adolescent there. Um, but living back in North Central Florida, I try to get back a couple times a year. And um, Papi, my dad, and I did make a specific research trip. Okay. Um, time has kind of like gotten away. I know it was not last last October. I'm sure it was the previous October. Yeah. Um, and we drove down to Key West and did did like some research around the area. But I got to spend. I was lucky enough, and I have a friend who he and several of his brothers actually they're like in the, in the dedication. In the, in the acknowledgments, um, they are firefighters for Key West and for Monroe County. And so the brother that works for Monroe County, um, Eric, arranged it so that I was able to spend a day out at the airport um, fire department where their older brother Carlos works. We're mm -hmm. at the very beginning, that's where Luis is. And, yeah. and then another fire station um, up in Stock Island, which is actually the, where Ana Maria lives. So I got to spend the day riding around and, and learning from them. And I got to dress, you know, dressing gear and, and participate in, um, they were do, like doing a workout, so like different stations. And so like oh I use that, that happens in, in book two. And, and I got to talk with a female firefighter paramedic. And so she really um, was a lot, was helpful inspiration wise for Ana Maria's story. Nice. Um, so, so that, that hands on for, for the Match to Perfection series, the, a lot of, I mean, we, when I was writing those, um, it, it initially for like book one, we still lived in Southern Illinois. So I would go up to Chicago. It's one of my favorite cities. I'm a huge Chicago Cubs fan. And, and um, yeah, here's my phone. Look at you. <laughs> so, um, so I would go up to Chicago as often as I could. And um, but the internet, you know, obviously helps a lot. Like for Sarah's OSFED, um, I did a lot of research on the internet. I listened to a lot of podcasts, um, for people who were going through it themselves for, um, about people with family members and, and how, the, and caregivers, how they could help and, 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 and those kinds of things so that I could also try to think about it from her, her family's perspective or what are some of the things that they might, some of the ways they might be reacting. Mm -hmm. um, I think with with um, so that was that was both listening to those podcasts. I um, actually listened to one coming back um, from New Orleans from Book Lovers Con last year. The eight hour trip um, was it was interesting, but it was also, parts of it were difficult. Parts of it were really humbling. Um, and and then my with that topic specifically, my my hope was that in 
and sharing that through Sarah's experience and through her family's, you know, experience and, and stuff that I, that I, that it comes across respectfully, um, and, and knowledgeably as much as knowledge as I can have not having lived that experience. Yeah. Um, but so I'm, I'm hopeful that, that it comes across re respectfully in, in the book. Um, as far as things that I learned that surprised me, I don't think there's anything that surprised me in, in book two in Alejandro, he has a fractured tibia hmm. and comes home like to, to rehab that. And I am not a blood and guts and, bodily fluids kind of person <laughs> at all. And um, what I watched a lot of YouTube videos, like I watched a surgery one, but I spent most of it like going, <laughs> going like this to kind of watch the screen, but cover the screen. Orthopedic um, surgeries with yeah, like that, drills and stuff. Yeah, I don't that, know. <laughs> yeah. Like a whole day. And my sister, who is one of my beta readers was like, Priscilla, you need to be writing. Like, what do you, what, you're, you're spending too much time <laughs> researching. And I said, I feel like I need to, I need to know all this stuff. And even if a minuscule amount goes into your book, for me, I, I feel like just knowing kind of what he had, what he went through, uh, um, hope, in my mind, it helps me get into his mind, uh, you know, kind yeah. of, kind of thing. I understand. That, that was interesting. Yeah. That's funny. Now I'm going to, well, no, I'm not going to do that, but I'm, <laughs> like, I'm like, are there really that many surgery, uh, videos on YouTube, but. Oh, wow. Yes. Yes, there are. <laughs> I should, I should never doubt. I know YouTube <laughs> has you videos find anything on the internet. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I even, um, like with the match perfection series with Diego and Lily's story, she's a victim's advocate. And I have a friend that lives here where I live. That's a victim's advocate, but so I, I picked her brain and like I took her out to dinner and we chatted about scenarios and things, but she made the good point that, you know, this is in, in Chicago and in Illinois, there are going to be some different, some, you know, some differences than in Florida. So for like, there were some specific scenes that I wanted to make sure could this happen or what would be protocol or what would, for I actually called um, a woman's shelter and um, to, to get some advice. And then I called for Diego. There's a scene where he's, he's working but I need him to be able to like go check on his sister and Lily and what, how could he do that if it's out of his like zone, you know, out of his area. Yeah. And, um, so I called a precinct, a, a precinct in, um, I just Googled, you know, what, what, this is the precinct that he would be working in if, if, you know, if he really lived there and there was like a, a human re like a personnel, like a public personnel office kind of thing. And I called and I just told the guy, Hey, here's what I'm doing, who I am. I just have a couple questions. And he told me this is what he would radio in. And this is the word, the phrasing that he would use. And, and, and this is how it could be belie believable. So, um, so that was interesting, you know, finding out things like that. Research queen. So internet, uh, but you also could like call people and just ask them, which is, seems like it makes sense. But in my mind, I'm like, wow, you called. Well, I'll tell you, I had to like, okay, you need to do it. You need to do it. <laughs> so, and it turned out to be really interesting. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, the things that you can learn just reading. Yeah. And, and I think that a lot of times people, well, not assume, but have that idea that when you're writing a contemporary novel that you, you know, don't have to do as much research because oh, you're, you know, you're living in contemporary times. Right. But the truth is that like your life, like you're saying, even place that you're living in or yeah. it's, Oh, I, I have a good time. Like I love house hunting and apartment hunting. Like in the match perfection series, Jeremy lives in this really posh condo, uh -uh. Yeah. in downtown Chicago. I would love to live where Jeremy lives. So house hunting for Jeremy or in, <laughs> in holiday home run, Ben is a former Chicago Cubs pitcher and he has to retire early because of um, like shoulder injury. And, but I wanted him to still live in Wrigleyville. There are a lot of Chicago Cubs players that live in Wrigleyville with their families. Yeah. So I went house hunting for Ben and found an <laughs> awesome home that I could never I would, I, well, I won't say could That's never, dream. but probably will never own. Um, and I got to go, you know, I lived vicariously, uh, through, through Ben, but, um, so house hunting, but also in that same series. And, and I, and I do it, I, I did it with, with, um, with the Key West, even though I've lived there and, and, and on a, I visited there, but I find a home that, that is there that I want them to live in and then Google satellites. So you can 
it's like in Diego's in the area. Around yeah, too. there's a scene in Diego's point of view in their perfect melody, and he's looking out through his blinds. Um, in uh, he lives in the Humboldt Park area in Chicago, and he's looking at uh, you know across the little alley streetway at the other apartments behind him, and. I just like I found a home on Zillow that was going to be Diego's and I did Google satellite and this is what it looks like if you look out the back window uh, like the kitchen window and and so that that way I felt like I was seeing what what Diego would see or what he could believably see uh, you know if you lived in this an apartment on this street in the Humboldt Park area of Chicago um, and and then get looking at it from not my Priscilla perspective, what are the things I would notice, but what are the things that Diego would notice as a cop if he was, if he was looking out his kitchen window um, while sipping a cup of coffee, you know, thinking about Lily. Yeah. You know, so those, those are, I, I enjoy that. That's the fun aspect, you know, for me of writing. Do you want, do that in the planning stages or do you find that like while you're writing, you get to a uh -huh. scene and think, Oh, I need to. A, a mix, you know, like I'll, I'll know where they live. Where, from the beginning and I have things in there I have a Scrivener I work in Scrivener yeah. so I have a Scrivener file that will have like the, I'll find the house like it's the house I drop like the um, the link to, to that that um, to that Zillow page you know mm -hmm. that website in there um, but then little things like when I'm describing like if I, and if I need to know the furniture that's in in a specific room or something I don't go to, I don't do that on in the beginning. I wait because I don't know if I, are they going to make it in the office? Do I need to know what's in the office or I just, you know, at the beginning, that I don't. Yeah. Um, so I, I'll go like furniture shopping um, or, and I, I've even gone clothing shopping, uh, you know, so like the dress that, that Ana Maria wears this dress for an event that happens in, in their book. And so I went clothes shopping for her and find a dress that I think looks great. And I, again, I, I take a screen, I have a picture and I drop that link in there. Um, or, um, so it's, it's kind of a mix. I'll find like the bigger things. This is where I know they live. This is what the house looks like. Um, but smaller details I'll find along the way as they come up. That sounds very fun. As far yeah, as it is. Can. Close shopping. I, fun. Um, I follow you on Instagram, I think Twitter too. And I know that you, um, sometimes talk about your writing day or like you'll have a dance break while you're writing or do, <laughs> do you, yeah. um, is that like, do you write all day and you take breaks like, you know, to do, or what is your routine? Um, well, it depends on, so like the semester and when my classes are, I teach, I'm adjunct faculty at two institutions. So mm -hmm. one is, is pretty much online for um, Seton Hill University. Their um, MFA in writing popular fiction mm -hmm. um, is predominantly online. It's a low res. So at the start of each semester, we usually have a week long residency. And now in June, it's virtual, so still from home. But I also teach at a local college here, technical communication, like business writing. So it depends on when my classes are. If it's like if I have this last semester, I had a Monday, Wednesday class. Um, so Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, are, are writing all day yeah. uh, but I also I'll write in, in the evening depends on like when I'm hitting up against a deadline I'm writing whenever you know all day every day uh, um, but my typically my day is a mix of writing social media stuff and you know grading uh, or I, I teach an online romance writing class for ed mm -hmm. to go and that's continual so I'm answering student you know, student discussion posts on, on there Monday through Friday. I'm, I'm answering those. So it's kind of a, a juggle, yeah. but the dance breaks are, are key. Um, I have a travel standing desk. I think we talked about it a little bit before yeah. that it's, it's collapsible so I can move it anywhere. And, um, I can tell sometimes like when I'm feeling stagnant, if I've been sitting too long or mm -hmm. just, I mean, my gosh, now they say sitting is kind of like the new smoking because so many you know, we're doing it, it, it you know, we're so, so stagnant. So try, I'll try to switch to my standing desk. And I listen to a lot of salsa, bachata, merengue, like when I'm writing, that kind of just helps me stay like in, in writing mode. Mm -hmm. And so um, it helps kind of get your juices flowing to take dance breaks. I will say I have to be careful sometimes if, if, if I'm like kind of struggling with the scene, I take a lot of dance breaks. And that's not good. 
So that's funny. If we were a fly on the wall and we caught you like deep into your writing, <laughs> what are we seeing? <laughs> What are you seeing? Well, if people are home, usually I have my headphones on and, and I've got, um, it's either one or the other. I'm either at my desk chair, like kind of chair dancing, or I'm standing at, you know, using my standing desk. Mm -hmm. um, and the music that's playing is I have a Pandora radio station I created. It's Luis Miguel Romances. So mm -hmm. a, lot of, a lot of old and new romances. If I'm editing, though um like then i can then i have like um it's a latin workout radio station and that's mm -hmm. the one that involves a lot of dance breaks <laughs> because it plays a lot of our my zumba songs oh cool. so, uh, um, um so kind of a mix of dancing um depends on where i where i am in the you know in my process but a lot of my but always music yes for sure um Megan always asks, what um, tropes do you love to read? Okay. To read, I think my, my favorite that, um, is the Friends to Lovers. And yeah. mostly, and I, I feel like I've, I've an, I answered this a little while ago in another one. So I'm like, try not to exactly repeat yourself. Uh, but the big, I think the thing that draws me is uh, I feel like there's problem. a little bit, I feel like there's a little bit more angst because if they're good friends, like, like they have something good right now. Do you really want to, to cross that line? And if it doesn't work out and it blows all up, then you have nothing. So I feel like it gives, as a reader, I'm always wondering, are, are you going to do it? Are you not going to do it? And then, and if they cross that line and it's a kiss or it's a, then I'm like, oh my gosh, how, you've ruined I'm, everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or like, what's going to happen? Is everybody okay that you, you know, and so for me, it gives a little bit. Or um, some, oh gosh, Adriana Herrera, the other day she said, it's not enemies to lovers. I got, I'm going to have to like. Oh, I've heard lovers. rivals, like rivals. Yes, that's what it was. Yeah. Rivals, rivals to lovers. And, and I think, that, I think that would, can be kind of interesting. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, I agree. Probably like that a little bit more than the enemies. Like if they're if they're competing versus they actively like dislike each other. I find yeah. that really yeah. hard. Like if I despise you, am I going to turn around and love you? Right. I mean, maybe, but you're going to have like there's a bigger arc or like a bigger bigger motivation or a bigger catalyst that has to occur really from enemies to you know yeah. I, and I guess I think enemies just sound so so ugly. I don't want to start from there. <laughs> Um, oh, I was going to ask you something else, and now my brain is going on yes. the front. Um, nope. Let's see. I'm going to yeah. forget. Um, Did you answer what you, or you said? Rivals to lovers is your is your favorite trope? Oh no, I. You can't ask me that. I have no favorites because I love <laughs> everything. <laughs> I'm always like I like friends to lovers. I do. I don't like. I don't love Secret Baby, That's a hard but one. I feel like everybody, every trope there is, there's somebody who could like sell me on it, you know? Yeah. I'll say, I hate done story correctly. and then I'll read one and be like, oh no, I like that. Right. Yeah, I think if done correctly, and for me as a reader, and it's the same thing I tell a lot of my students, that um, the motivation behind yeah. why was it a secret baby, right? Or, or why did you feel the need? If, if that is strong enough or if that is believable enough, I can go with it. But yeah. I have not, I've not written a secret baby. I, I, I don't know. I'd have to, I, it's I'm not, not sure my favorite I either because I, I, I would feel such guilt about keeping that lie for so long as I, I'd have to, as the author, I'd have to really feel strongly about my character's motivation to be able to get inside their head to be able to write a believable story. Yeah, you know, I think like, I also, I mean, <laughs> I was thinking like it would have to be historical or paranormal or some other world where it was <laughs> like not, yeah. because it is, I feel like it would be really hard to overcome just the idea of like, why wouldn't you, why wouldn't you tell right. somebody that this is their baby? But People have done um, it really well. Mona Schroff, and I wish, I keep forgetting to look at her, because I, I don't want to say her title wrong, but but Mona Schroff, her debut came out earlier this year, and it's a... The one with the, like, aerial view of them yes, on the couch? It's a, yes, it's a, it's a couple, and, like, their heads are together. It's a fabulous cover, um, and that's a secret, baby. Years, like, I think she oh, said... I didn't know that. Um, yes. I don't want to mess up a detail, but it's like, 
13, 15 years and there's strong motivation, but we had a conversation on another like author reader event a few weeks ago. And she talked about um, the, you know, the motivation and how she's gotten some flack. Um, but I think as a whole, we all kind of agreed that, well, it just depends on the why. And if the why is strong enough in pretty much anything, uh, yeah. you know, I think even if, um, when I talk about GMC goal motivation conflict, I, I always will like in, in a presentation or with students, whatever I say, look, if that why is strong enough, you, or it needs to be strong enough that your reader, even if your reader is like, I, I would totally, I would <laughs> never do that. But, but I can see why you're, I can see why you're going there. Okay. So I'm going to go with you, but I, oh my gosh, right. Yeah. That it has to be enough for them to say, holy, oh my gosh, but, but, but I'm with you, yeah. you know, and then let's turn the page and keep going. I think Beverly Kendall wrote some uh, historicals and uh, oh, I think I want to say it was like Air of Deception or something like that, that it was called. And that was a secret baby book. It's historical. Okay. And um, when you find out like, what, like, I mean, the heroine left the continent to like, and so, and there was like before phones and before telegrams. Yeah. And so it was kind of like, okay, well, I can't, oh, yeah, yeah. But she had no choice but for it to be a secret. The pigeon got lost, right? The the the, the pigeon with the note. Yeah, the yeah. pigeon <laughs> went somewhere. Or the bird, whatever. <laughs> um, but yeah, she. Um, so yeah, that book completely. I never even questioned. Like, of course, oh, yeah. yeah. There was no. It was a. I'm sorry. It was a secret. Um, yeah. But yeah. So like I say, every I'm like. I love all, I love all the things, right. um, depending on like, I'm also a very moody reader. So some days I'm like, I oh. definitely need angst. And other days I'm like, yeah. no angst. Nope. I have to be like, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, I just, I just read Quana Jackson's, uh, Real Men Knit. Ooh, Real Men Knit. Yeah. It just came out. I really enjoyed yes. that. And I, yes. um, and it was, I was like, I, this was just what I wanted today which okay. was perfect because I like absolutely I, lo I loved it but it was yes. um but I'm moody about stuff like that Somet yeah. you know like sometimes I want um more and I feel like some tropes tend toward more uh angst and some tend yeah. towards more I think I always love like the grumpy one and the sunshiny one <laughs> I, <have them. laughs> I do like that most most of the time Kelly Siskin has um, her, a book that came out like the week before mine or like around mine. Um, it's called Don't Go Stealing My Heart. And she's got a hero that really pos positive. He's a little bit guarded, right? Um, uh -huh. Like we're fit with his family, but kind of positive. And she is really prickly. Um, and she does a good job of mixing those That's together. Cool. I always try to, when someone asks me, what's your favorite trope? Part of me feels like I should, I need to say like the one I'm writing because I better like it because I'm writing it, you know? So like I would say like, well, fake engagement, or I'm trying to think when I was writing like Ana Maria's, mm -hmm. that is the second chance romance. Yeah. And I, what I think what I really liked about um, the rivals instead of enemies is because that's how I, that's how I see Enrique and his heroine is Natalia um, as rivals. Like she wants him to do something and he's determined not to. And it, the way, you know, so it's like a battle of wills. Yeah. Point. Yes. So that, that well, that. you are. I remembered what I was going to ask you about earlier. Yeah. Um, Luis and Sarah have a very kind of short time frame uh, yeah. to work with as far as like um, growing a relationship that they at the beginning are really not planning on growing at all. They're just kind of like seven days. Seven yeah. days. You and and really like they were trying to make it like as low. He, like, I don't think he even um, intended to like stay in the house necessarily no, yeah. or do. Yeah. So it was, it was really like, please do me this favor and then we'll never see each other again. Yeah. Um, so I, I thought you did a great job of like packing a lot into those days. Like I remember there was a point in the book when I was like, how much time has passed? It had been <laughs> a day, but they, you know, they, they, I, I'm going to say for me, I have met people in my life that it's like, I met them and immediately felt like I already knew them. Like at first mm -hmm. I want to know everything about you. And also you feel like my friend. Yeah. Um, 
And I feel like that's like that first time that they went out like and had the picnic and just kind right. of were like, okay, well, tell me about yourself. It felt like they were already like friendly right. and, um, and I mean, they, they, they're attractive people. So clearly they were both like, yeah, I noticed this, <laughs> yes. but, um, but yeah, I think that that can be it to me as a person who aspires to one day publish something. I feel yeah. like that seems challenging to have something that's uh, like right. a relationship that's brand new, that's, that, um, is flourishing in a, in a kind of compressed, like it gave them um, kind of a ticking time clock. Kind of condensed. Was, right. I think, I mean, like we say, when you're like the craft of writing, having that ticking clock is really good because it, it ups kind of like the anxiety in everybody. Mm -hmm. um, they had to by default, you know, like fa uh, Sarah's family thinks that they've been dating for several months and, and Sarah has allowed her mom to believe that they might be even close to, you know, like be getting engaged or go get, getting more serious um, which is not the case at all. You know, this this is a guy that, you know, you learned from the beginning, Sarah was already iffy about, but she just did not want to come to this forced, you know, or mandatory family week-long vacation on the company because her si her siblings were going to have their perfect uh, spouses and her parents have their perfect marriage. And then once again, there would just be her. Uh, um, so she was bringing this, her boyfriend along just kind of by default because she needed someone and then the loser upped and showed he was a loser by dumping her you know by by no showing yeah. um so well, and she kind of breaks up with him like immediately so clearly she was just kind of like right any, that, any person i just need yes a yes fan. yeah I'm like i think by then she had already she was already knowing that you know this is not going to work out like on paper we look good but like in reality this is not not what i need yeah. um and him no showing was just like a you know, exclamation point. Like, the coffin. Yeah. Um, but so, so they needed to kind of know, we get to know each other. Hence why Sarah like breaks out the notebook and, and starts, okay, I'm going to take notes, you know, to, to, to help me. And, and they kind of have like this cram session. So I, I felt like they maybe what like on a normal time frame would have taken, you know, several weeks at least, or maybe even like several dates and, and months they crammed into this the few hours before her family was landing in Key West. Yeah. Um, and, uh, um, and then, you know, you want to up the stakes. So like, yes, they had just anticipated that Luis would stay with his family and they would say he was visiting family and, and, but Sarah's, you know, parents, the, the first kind of twist is, Oh, you're not staying with us. We wanted more time kind of together. And of course you're going to stay with us. And, so and family has an excellent way of doing that of like, yes. oh, no, you're yeah. Gonna do that. yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, that forced proximity, I hope. Uh, um, and then the whole, the whole idea of Sarah feeling like I need someone on my team because it's going to be me against them. And Luis being who he is, mm -hmm. uh, you know, wanting to be supportive and like, yeah, I can be a team player and save the day for you. And so he kind of just yeah. jumps on that. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm hoping, uh, uh, you know, love at first sight can happen and, yeah. and all of that, you know, so, uh, uh I, but they I were also, I, I mean, they were attracted at first sight for sure, but they also seemed like they did develop a relationship and, mm -hmm. um, and I thought it was, I mean, I thought it was cool the way that you did it and the way that you like Thank set you. them up to be like, well, now you're stuck. <laughs> you better learn each <laughs> other. Um, so. Yeah, it was it was nice for me um, anyway as a reader when I was reading it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so you said next you're writing more books in this series. Yes. And um, do you have any other th like things coming up or that people well, should I be have, looking um, for? Well, Ana Maria's book, like book two in the series right now is still scheduled for next May. And then I'm actually working on a novella for Kensington that would come out. Um, I'm not, again, with that, I, I don't know if anything has been announced yet at okay. all. So I don't know if I can say, um, but it, it's um, w with two other authors um, uh, and kind of three friends that are, are connected, you know, um, yeah. you know, like that know each other. They live in this, they live in the city. Um, it's, it's set in, in New York right now. I don't know if that, if that will change, but we're, we're, you know, that's kind of where, how we've written them or how we're writing them 
it, and so each it's a you know the each friend will have their own little love story nice. and you know but there we, we talk about how they're connected like there's a, a little prologue just to kind of show how they're connected and then we get into all three stories so i'm, I'm writing that nice. and um as soon as i'm done with like revisions for book two i will write um enrique's story book three and we can let that yeah that one I think is based, I'm in Key West and she's from Chicago. So I have plotted unless, you know, unless they tell me something, unless the characters tell me something different, they like, that will involve a trip to Chicago. Uh, oh, and, and then Are they going to go see the Cubs? Dep well, I think it could be, I think it's summer. So they <laughs> could, for me, if, if you're there, that was one of the, fun, the most fun scenes to write or, or a couple scenes in their perfect melody Diego and Lily take some of the kids from the youth center and they go to a Cubs game. And then afterwards they go to Cubby Bear. Um, and that I, that I didn't need to research, you know, before I wrote it, cause I'd done it, you know, before, <laughs> but I would have gladly gone back to the Cubby Bear to have a beer after a Cubs game, you know, if I really needed to before writing that scene, I, I would not have. Cool. Really. <laughs> well, um, Thank you so much for hanging out with us all month long. And then um, I guess you do Four Chicas Chat on Facebook. Yes. And then you're Pris Oliveras, right? P-R-I-S um, on uh, Instagram and on Twitter. And on Twitter, yes. Same on Facebook or no? Um, yes, on Facebook for, um, because there are a million ways to misspell Priscilla. So it's just Pris Oliveras. Um, that's my author page on Facebook. And like you said, Inst my handle, Instagram and Twitter are the same. And on Facebook, the two, I'm in um, Four Chicas Chat. Mm -hmm. There are four of us, Mia Sosa, Alexis Daria, and Sabrina Sol, who are uh, Latinx ROM authors. And the, the, the group is kind of like our casa, if you want to come and, and hang out and just chat. I'm also one of the 11 authors in Fiction from the Heart on, oh, cool. on Facebook. Um, and both of them are kind of low promo, more come hang out with us, talk about things we like, things you like, um, nice. recipe, you know, that kind of stuff, just kind of getting to know you and, and hanging out, kind of bringing us together when we're all spread out all over the place. Very nice. Well, yeah. thank you very much. And um, hopefully we'll see you again soon when we uh, get more books from you. Yes. It was so fun hanging out. Thanks so much for, for picking Island Affair this month. It's been fun hearing your recaps and, and, and all of that. I've enjoyed sharing it with you. Oh, good. Thank you. It's been fun. <laughs>